to be at this morning. A, a detour from Second Peter. We'll be there again soon. But um, this morning, I want to bring a message to you. It uh, actually is is in the same vein of thought that uh, we saw last time we were in Second Peter, uh, addressing false teachers and such. Um, not quite as the severity, maybe, but um, in the same line of thought. And I, I did not realize that when I originally began studying this, or um, we considered it and believed the Lord was leading this way, but uh, in, in studying it, uh, the Lord showed me that connection. And so I believe this will be helpful to us. Hebrews chapter 10, and the Get everything situated here. I'm forgetting my phone. Make sure it doesn't interrupt me. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 10, and let's start in verse 15. It says, whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he uh, had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and in their minds while I like them. And their sins and iniquities while I remember no more. Now whatever mission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of of Jesus by a new and living way, which he had consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let, us, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the matter of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as ye see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Here we, we find a, a wonderful truth, a wonderful promise that God has given to us. And, and the first opening of the uh, scriptures we've read here, uh, the writer of Hebrews is making the case that Christ is better. And that's really the, the whole um, uh, thrust of the letter to the Hebrews here, that Christ is better. Christ is better than the Old Testament sacrifices. Christ is better than all those things. And Christ has replaced those things. He's fulfilled the prophecies. And he has given us salvation. And we just caught the tail end of that here, okay? Uh, in uh, his, his argument for that uh, in verse 15. And we're going we're gonna to look through some of that, all right? But that then gives us an obligation. The wonderful privileges and blessings of salvation that have been bought and purchased uh, by Christ and then have given to us through Christ gives us a responsibility. And that's what we find that in the middle part of the scriptures that we've read, there's a, a, an obligation to be together and to exhort one another and to come boldly before the throne of grace. And so there is an obligation there, and then we find a warning at the end, all right? And here we find uh, the three ways I break this down into all right, a new welcome, all right? Uh, a new work, and then third, a new warning, a new warning. And this morning, this message will be one that, uh, you know, I can, I can honestly say that the, you here this morning are the ones who probably don't need it. The ones who aren't here are the ones who need it. But we need to be faithful to God's house. That is the message this morning, all right? And um, I don't believe God's led us here in vain either, all right? I say that. I put that out there. But I don't know how God will do in your heart, all right? Now, I want to put this preface on it as well. I am not trying to... Uh, uh, guilt people into being in God's house. I, I, I'm not. That's not my job. You know, uh, I'm not the Holy Spirit. 
My job is to deliver the message. I'm just the mailman, as one preacher put it. Amen? But this is the message that God has for us today. And uh, I fully believe that. Um, uh, God's laid this on my heart for the past several weeks. And um, I just I believe we need to be reminded as a church that we need to exhort one another. Amen? We need to edify the saints. And, and to do that, uh, we need to see why God has commanded that and, and, and how we do that. And so this morning, as we look at this passage, I hope that we'll understand that, all right, that we, this is what we've got, we have for us to learn. We must enter into the privilege that Christ has afforded us to come before the throne of God and to invite others to enter in with us, amen, to invite others to enter in with us as well. What a privilege we have to come and to walk with him in the garden, as we sang, amen, to know it as well with our soul, to, to, to fellowship with him before the throne of God, but then what a greater privilege, and even it is a responsibility to invite others to come along with us, amen, to fellowship together before the throne of God. That's what God desires for each one of his children. That's what God desires for his church, and that's exactly what we see being laid out here in the book of Hebrews. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll get into the, the scriptures here. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this morning, and Lord, uh, we certainly do thank you. It's already been said. We thank you for this place. Lord, set aside to, for us as believers, as a church body, to come and to fellowship, to worship you, and Lord, to learn from you and to learn from your word. So God, I pray now that you would do your work in our hearts. Lord, there's nothing that I can say or nothing that uh, I could do this morning that will have any uh, eternal impact. Uh, Lord, I, I might uh, say something or, or, or Lord, do something that might last for a while, but Lord, only you can change hearts and minds. So, God, we ask you to do that. I pray that each one of us, Lord, will be open to what you would have to say to us this morning. Lord, this, uh, this scripture and this message is one that has convicted me, and, God, you've worked it through me, first of all. And, Lord, I recognize my need, Lord, to exhort the believers more, Lord, to edify and to encourage us all the, all the more. And, Lord, uh, I certainly want to be an example of that. But, Lord, I believe this is not just for the pastor. It's for each one of us. And, God, I pray we would receive it, Lord, not from the pastor, but from God. Lord, that you speak into us, and Lord, that your Holy Spirit will do its work. Lord, encouraging us, and Lord, uh, encouraging us to continue doing what's right. Lord, correcting us where we're wrong, and changing us, Lord, for the better. I pray you get honor and glory through all that is said and done here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. The first thing we see here is a new welcome, all right? And the, the, the verses we read, verses 15 through 21, and I'm not going to read them all again for time's sake, but a new welcome. And I mentioned you know, as introductory, uh, the whole letter to the Hebrews is Christ is better. That's the, 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 the premise of this. And he's making the argument like a lawyer. Uh, many believe Paul wrote this, and I, I'm inclined to believe that myself, all right? Uh, there I, I said it. I'm on record, okay? <laughs> but um, uh, whoever the writer was, God himself is making the argument that Christ is better. Amen? And he's better than the Old Testament systems. He's better than all those things previous that were representations of what Christ would do on the cross. Right. And the results then are laid out for us here, part of those results in these verses. Uh, the first thing we see is a new position in this new welcome. Here, uh, let, let's go back and read verse 16. He says, this is the covenant I'll make with them after those days. I uh, said, the Lord, I'll put my laws into their hearts and in their minds while I write them. Their sins and iniquities while I remember no more. Now, th this is a, a, a quotation from uh, Jeremiah's writings, and yes, the interpretation of that would be it relates to the nation of Israel. And that is a, a day that is looking forward uh, to the kingdom. One day, the nation of Israel is going to be purified of sin, and there will be a pure nation that will exist on the earth. A literal kingdom will be fulfilled. And Christ will rule and reign from Jerusalem for 1,000 years. Amen. Uh, we who are, are saved are going to witness that. And we'll uh, rule and reign with him in some, fa in some fashion. Not sure how that's going to happen. But he's going to rule on the throne of his father David. And at that time, then their hearts will be pure. And the covenant, he will write it in their hearts. And there will be no sin, no iniquity. What, what a wonderful time. But the amazing thing is, now the Holy Spirit, through inspiration, takes this same promise to the nation of Israel and applies it to us, applies it to the church. Now, we, we know that that is not our state, is it? That, that, that's not how we are. Uh, that, that's not, we don't, um, 
exists in a state that uh, we constantly think of the Lord's commandments. Now, it'd be nice if it would, but the, the simple truth is, the practical aspect is we have to put God's word in our heart, don't we? We have to memorize the scriptures. It's not there automatically. It's not by default. Uh, we, we strive to, to remember God's word, and we want to act upon God's word, but it's not just by default because we still have a sin nature. But the beautiful thing is, as a result of salvation, is that's how God sees us. That's not how we are in practice, but that is our position. And God says, in their sins and iniquities, I remember no more. What a beautiful thought. Praise God. Now, that's not how we are in our practice. I don't know about you, but I've already had to do some confessing this morning. I've already messed up. God sees us how we are. That's how, that's how we are in our practice, but that's not how God sees you, child of God. When you come before the Lord, in 1 John 1, 9, it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The, the confession is you agree with God. Confession means you agree with God. God says, you sin. You, you've broken my commandment. You have fallen short of the mark of perfection, of, of holiness. You say, I did. I agree. I was wrong, God. And I'm sorry. And I want to change this. I don't want to do that again. I know I've, I've broken your heart. I have failed you. I have failed the grace that you offered to me. And I, I'm confessing that, God, and I ask you to help me. Will you please forgive me? He says, it's already done. It's already done. And he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Amen? And that's the position we're in. Now, we have to continually work at the practice. Because then we, 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 we mess up again, don't we? We sin again. We have to confess it again. But our position is... It's how he sees us here in Hebrews. He sees us as completely cleansed, completely forgiven. What a wonderful position we find ourselves in. And here, this promise given to the nation of Israel, uh, the Holy Spirit, through inspiration, has applied it to the church. Amen? He's applied it to us. Now, let's keep reading verse 18. He says, Now, wherever mission of these is, there's no more offering for sin. Uh, Meaning that no more offering for sin, there's no need. You know, and, and we can go in off on this and the details, but we don't have to get saved again. When you sin, child of God, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us. You don't have to go back to Calvary and be saved again. You didn't lose it. Amen. There's no more offering for sin. The offering of sin was once and for all. Praise God. You just have to go back and reapply it. But the blood is still there every time you go back, amen? Every time you need it, it's always there. There's no more offering for sin. It's been paid, amen? We just have to recognize that and acknowledge it. So uh, we don't have to get saved over and over again, but we need to confess that sin as a daily practice, amen? Each time, or each time we sin, amen? We need to confess that sin. But the offering is, is completed. So then we find ourselves in, in this, this new position, all right? Verse 19, having therefore, because of that sin, because there's no more offering for sin, because it's paid for, because he says your sins and iniquities I remember no more, because of all that, we then have boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Wow, what a privilege, amen? What a privilege we have. Uh, we have boldness. Uh, here, it, we, we find where we're invited into uh, the holiest, the holy of holies. And here it's, we see verse 20, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Now this is, of course, written to Hebrew believers, and so there's a lot of um, <laughs> pictures in, in, in the wording here. And uh, the, he's, the writer's making application of what we have in Christ today in the picture of what we, what we saw in the Old Testament. And even what they saw here in, uh, in their present day in the temple. All right? At this time, uh, the temple was still there in Jerusalem. And these believers, the, their situation was they were being tempted to, because of the persecution to turn back. And to turn away from following Christ through faith and going back to the old ways of Judaism. And they, they saw this temple. They saw the, the veil there. They saw all of that. And here, uh, the, 
the, the writer, he's giving us this picture. He says, Christ has fulfilled all that. You know, if we were there in, in that day, and we were at Herod's temple, I don't believe we have any Jews here today, as far as I know, all right? You and I could go to the court of the Gentiles, and that's as far as we could go. We could look through the gate, and we could see where offerings were being made. We could see the, the altar there. But we couldn't. There's no way we'd ever get in there. There's no way we're getting beyond this outer court, the court of the Gentiles. Only Jews can go in there and make their sacrifices. But beyond that outer court and beyond even in the inner court, then there's that building, the actual temple. And within that temple, there's an entry room, there's a table of showbread, there's candelabra, there's a few uh, pieces of furniture there, and the priest can go into that room. But beyond that room, then, is another room, the Holy of Holies. It's the designated spot. On this earth where God exists. And only one priest, once a year, can go into that place. It's where the Shekinah glory comes. It's where the ark of the covenant comes. Within that ark, and the ark is like a, you say, a chest, for lack of a better term. The golden wind. With angels overseeing on, on top of that. Angels carved out of that made of overlaid in gold, making what is represented in heaven of the mercy seat. Within within this chest, you have tables to keep the covenant, the law. And on top of this mercy seat, then this priest, this one priest, would go in once a year. And put the blood of a pure animal on the mercy seat. And the atonement for the sins of the people would meet the justice of the law on the mercy seat. What a beautiful picture. What a beautiful picture of salvation. Now all of that was fulfilled at Calvary. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Everything that Christ did down to the very you have know, one priest go into one room one time a year. You know, that was the very day Christ died. On the day that that priest went in to make the atonement, Christ hung on the Calvary, shed his blood, and paid for the sins of the world. Tell you something even more amazing than that. Now, now that all that's been accomplished through Christ, Verse 19, we have boldness to enter into the holy place. God says, child of God, I'm not just letting you into the inner court. I'm not just giving you equal rank with the Jews, with the nation of Israel. I'm not just giving you equal rank with the priest. That you can, you can make sacrifices for, for one another. I'm giving you equal rank with the high priest. That you can come right into the Holy of Holies and fellowship directly with me. Amazing thing, we can go back to the Gospels and, and, and look, but here, and, and he says in, in verse 20, he says, through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. The veil, what separated these two rooms, the, the, the holy place from the most holy place, was a, a veil, a literal like curtain, if you will, but not just any curtain. This is a huge curtain, thick curtain. But let me uh, uh, read you a little bit about this, all right, make sure I don't leave any, any things out here. All right? The veil, a most instructive feature of the temple, was blue, scarlet, and purple. And it spoke of Christ and his incarnation. All right? This was a picture of the deity of Christ and his humanity all woven together as one, all right? The blue being the color of heaven, 
It suggests to us that Jesus is the Son of God, the one who came from heaven itself. The scarlet reminds us that he was the Son of Man, the last Adam. The very same, the very name Adam means red. But the purple then takes it beyond that because he was fully God and fully man. And yet when you wove, when you weave these two colors together, you have a combination motion, a violet color. Jesus Christ in his earthly body was the perfect man. He was holy God. He never ceased to be God. He was holy man. And he wove, those two were woven together in a way that we cannot comprehend. But together he became the perfect sacrifice. He could be asleep on the boat from a weary body and yet be awoken by frightened disciples and tell the slaves, peace be still. And calm the waters. He could hunger and thirst like we were, and yet he could feed the thousands. He could have compassion and mourn the loss of Lazarus, and then he could call forth from the grave, Lazarus, arise! Lazarus, come forth and command the dead to come out of the graves. Who but God could do all those things? Who but man could feel those things? He was the perfect God-man. <laughs> and here we see a picture of him woven together, his, his deity and humanity together, and the, the picture of the veil it is woven together for us. And yet, we would find in the Gospels, and here it says in, in verse 20, that it is through the veil, his flesh, through the veil. On the, on the cross of Calvary, his flesh was beaten. He was tortured. He didn't even look like a man. Beaten beyond recognition. All of his members looked at him, the Psalms said. And when Christ died on the cross, God took the veil of the temple and rent it from top to bottom to indicate that the body of Christ was being pointed to us. And through the veil, beyond the veil, is the Holy of Holies, the holiest place. Through his flesh, we have access into the Holy of Holies. We have access, brethren, boldness. Not to come meekly, not to come lowly, not to come in, in, in fear, but to come boldly. Wow. What an amazing invitation we have, amen? As the children of God, what an amazing privilege we have because we're purchased by the blood of Christ, because we've received what he's done on the cross as payment for our sins, and we've received the forgiveness of sins. He has given us access to the holy of holies. Wow. Not, not restricted to pray through a man, through a priest, not restricted just to the uh, to, to be a, a select group of people like the Jewish nation. No, we have boldness to come in directly to the God of heaven and to the Holy of Holies. What a privilege. We find a place there. Verse 21, we see again who has given us this access and having a high priest over the house of God. Uh, we won't have time to look back, but we can see it in, in Hebrews that uh, Christ is our great high priest. Amen. He is the one who went then, when he died, he went, he ascended to heaven and put his blood upon the literal mercy seat in heaven. He is our great high, high priest. Amen. And he is the one who has given us this access. And because it's not because we have uh, earned this, it's not because we have the right, but it's because of him. He invites us to come with him boldly the throne of grace. Amen? What a privilege we have. What an opportunity to come. And the God of all creation, the God who rules the universe, invites us to come and to sit down and fellowship with him. I've never been invited to have a cup of tea with, with any political party, any political leader. I've never had a, a, a lunch with any great well-known men, really. I can sit down every morning and have fellowship with the God of all gods. I can come to the end of my day and share my heart with the God of all eternity. What a blessing. I can come and I may not be able to petition the leaders of this nation. I may not be able to petition the, the, 
you know, the leaders of this world, but I can petition the God of all gods and say, I have a need. I need you to move. I need you to act on my behalf. I need you to move on, on this person's behalf. I need you to, to, to do something here. I need your wisdom. What am I to do here? What a privilege. We are welcomed before the throne of God. Amen. What a, what a blessing. I believe I could preach on it all afternoon. I won't, all right? But what a, what a privilege. What a blessing. But let's, let's keep looking then, all right? Verse 22, then, we find then we have a new work. All right? We, we've been giving this opportunity, but with great opportunity comes great responsibility. Verse 22, he says, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Here he begins explaining how we're to do this. Uh, we have a new work that then is to do. God has given us the opportunity to come all over before his throne. What are we to do with that then? First of all, he says we're to do it in full assurance. In full assurance of faith. This is a faith that looks forward. You know, one of the problems that, these, that the Hebrews had here uh, in, in uh, this letter that's being uh, written to them is they kept looking back. Kept looking back. They saw the temple and they saw all the, the elaborate ornaments of the temple and all those things and uh, the, the law and, and it was their custom. I mean, for generations, this is what had been the, the norm. And people knew that Jehovah God was their God. He was the God of all gods. And uh, the, the um, Jews from around the world would come and worship at the temple for the Passover. And people knew that. And that the Jewish traditions and the Jewish religion was respected. Oh, it certainly wasn't followed, but wow, what, what commitment, what faith of the, the Jewish people. And now they've forsaken that to follow in faith Christ. A faith that is a faith and not seen. A religion that is more than religion. A faith that is not contained in elaborate ornaments and long flowing robes, and, and yearly sacrifices being offered, it's found in faith. Faith in what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And they're, and, and they're, they're, they're looking back to all that and saying, but we can see all that, and it, and it looks, it, it's inviting to the flesh. It's appealing to the flesh, because we can see what we're actually doing, we're accomplishing, we've made the sacrifice, we know it's finished. Here we have to just simply trust that it was accepted. If I saw the animal being sacrificed, then I know it's done. But here I have, to, I have to see with eyes of faith. And that's hard sometimes. But we walk by faith, not by sight. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 the writer here is saying, you've got to have full assurance of faith that God has purged you. God has cleansed you. He said, your sins, I'll remember no more. You don't have to offer the sacrifices. Keep, don't look back anymore. Just look forward to what God has done. What God's given to you. It's a faith that looks forward in full assurance of faith. So there's a, a faith that needs to be there. But then there is, second of all, a, a cleansing. Notice he says, our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and bodies washed. And here the bodies washed is it's a, a picture of what the priests would do then. In the Old Testament, they did. They had to do it, go through a a ritual bath before they would go in into the temple. And it was a picture. They were cleansed from sin. And here, God's telling us, not that we have to take a bath, all right, as much as hygiene is good, amen, and hygiene is, is a good thing, all right, but he's saying, you need to be cleansed before you come before God. Make sure you have your sins confessed. Make sure you have your heart right with God. Come before him with a pure heart. Not with ill intent, not with uh, you know a root of bitterness, not with pride, uh, not with um, uh, unconfessed sin, but make sure you've got your heart right before God. Well, not just take it for granted. You know what, what a privilege we have, and, and, and we as 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 Gentiles, I, I believe we, we do take it for granted because we don't realize all of the. It wasn't just rituals, but it was requirements. That had to be accomplished before they, before the one man, one time a year, could go before God. And yet we have the opportunity to do that on a daily basis. Several times a day. We, we lose the 
the beauty of it and, and the severity of it. And God says, don't take it for granted. Make sure you're cleansed before you come to full. It's a privilege we have here. We need to be cleansed. We need to come in full assurance. Here he says, uh, verse 23, let's hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. The word profession, it means to seize. To seize. All right? Uh, he says, you, you need to be looking forward and, and, and grab on to what God has for you. And then he says, let us keep reading. Verse 24, let us consider one another unto, uh, another to provoke unto love and to good works. Here when he says, consider one another, it means to fully observe. Fully observe. And provoke there, it means to, it means what it means. It means kind of agitate. All right? Now, we think about provoking in a negative sense, but there is a positive aspect of provoking. All right? We need to provoke, we need to encourage one another unto love and to good works. You know, when someone is encouraging you to do the right thing, that's a good provocation. That's exactly what this is talking about. Provoke unto love and to good works. But to do that, we have to consider one another. We have to fully observe. Be aware. To be aware, then, makes the next connection, verse 25. He says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is. But exhorting one another. You know, the simple truth is, and the logic is here, we can't fully observe one another and if we're forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. You know, if, if we're not committed to coming together faithfully, then we're going to know each other's needs. You know, I went by and saw uh, Selma Thursday, and I was so glad. So I went over there, and I, as soon as I got there, and, and those of you, you, you go up and, and visit, you, you know how it is. Betty's there every day. Her car wasn't there. Uh, something's, something's going on. So I go back to see in someone's room, and the door was closed. And that made me even more concerned. I go to the nurse's station, and I see, looking for, uh, for Selwyn Lee and his wife. <laughs> they hear him. I say, oh, yeah, yeah. He, he should be back there. And told me he's just getting ready for the day. And I'm like, okay, well. He's, he's here. I guess he might be a hospital or something. Yeah, but um, go back there, and a few minutes later, they were done getting ready for the day, and, and I come in, and Betty's not there, and the nurse tells me that she's had surgery that day. But someone would have would have likely have been there all day without anybody to be there. To... <clears throat> Betty comes every day. You say, well, that's that's her husband. I know. That's one of what she does there. <laughs> But hey, you know what? Someone needs encouragement. Someone needs somebody to go by and see him. And I'm just throwing out one example, all right? We've got others in our church. And some of you, you do. You go by and you see them. I appreciate it so much. I really do. Hey, um, we've got our college prayer meetings on Wednesday nights, once a month. And the reason we do that is for people like them. They can't come out on Wednesday nights. But we can go to them. Amen. But if we're forsaking the assembly, we can't fully observe what they need. You know, if I went by to see someone on Thursday, I've never known that Betty was having surgery that day. I'm so glad I did. And if, 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 if we neglect the Wednesday night prayer meetings, we don't know what's going on through the week with each other. We're missing it. How can we fully observe one another? And notice here, he says, it's a group effort, okay? Go back to verse 22. He says, let us draw near. Verse 23, let us hold fast. Verse 24, let us consider one another. It's us. It's not you. It's us. Each and every one of us. Church, we are a collective body, amen? And when, when the body suffers, we all suffer. 
when the body rejoices, we all rejoice. Amen. Hey, when somebody gets a visa, we all rejoice. Amen. <laughs> when we get four visas, the whole church got visas. Amen. Hey, when the body suffers, we all suffer. When somebody's struggling through a surgery, when somebody's struggling with cancer, when someone's struggling over a lost loved one and they're really burdened, we all suffer. And how are we going to do that if we're forsaken the assembly? We've got to be faithful. <laughs> Amen. I'm not trying to put a guilt trap on any, anybody. Okay? I know we've got members that you can't come on Wednesday nights. But I believe God just, God laid us on my heart two or three weeks ago. We need to be reminded that, hey, if we're able, we need to be here. Because we need one another. Amen. I've been reminded this week just how much we need one another. Let me quickly move to the third point here. <clears throat> Verse 26. We see a, a new warning. He says, For if we sin willfully after that we've received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Now here he says, if we sin willfully, and we could say by application, well, sin, that's sin in general, in any sense. But in the context of the passage, the sin he's speaking of, forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. When we willfully say, I just don't think I can make it tonight. I'm not saying you're laid up and you're sick. I'm not saying you got a stomach bug and you said, well, you know what, I'm just going to share it with everybody. No, please don't do that. <laughs> All right. If you're sick, we don't want you. To stay. Call me. Or call somebody. Let let us know. We will pray for you while you're at home. Okay. We don't want you sharing your blood with us. All right. <laughs> uh, you know, if you have a sick child, you know we understand. All right. But I'm talking about making it a priority. We have to make it a priority because if we don't, we get wrapped up in the things of this day. And the devil will make sure we forget this Wednesday. And we will miss Wednesday night. We'll forget we're meeting down at so-and-so's house for this coming Wednesday night, and we'll miss the cottage prayer meeting. We'll get so busy, we don't have time to go by and see Sister So-and-so and encourage her and pray with her, or him, whatever it might be. But hey, we got to do it on purpose. But if we sin willfully, he says, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Now, what does that mean? We just said that the sacrifice for sins, there is no more sacrifice. There's no need for that. He's not speaking here of having to get saved again, all right? And this is the connection I want to make with Second Peter. We looked at it a few weeks ago, all right? Verse 27, he says, but a, fearful, a certain fearful looking of judgment and fire indignation which shall devour the adversaries. What he's saying here is, church, if you forsake the assembling of yourselves, you're giving an indication you were never really saved. And that you're looking for another way of salvation. And he says, there is none. There is no more sacrifice. There is no other way of salvation. But Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples. If you have love one to another. One of the first indications that Christ gave that we are his disciples is that we will come together, we will fellowship and encourage one another and lift each other up in prayer. That's not the word of your pastor. That's the word of our Savior. Let that sink in. It's not me trying to throw a guilt trip or a point fingers this morning. I'm simply delivering the message. I believe God had me for our church. We need to consider one another. We need to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. We need to recognize this is what God saved us for. To lift each other up. To take advantage of the opportunity we have. To come boldly before the throne of grace. And then come together collectively before the throne of Christ. Amen. Hey, what a privilege we have. <laughs> what, what opportunity we have. Let's not neglect. He says, verse, verse 27 there, he says, There is no more sacrifice for sins. There is no other way that we say. All that's left is a certain fearful looking or of judgment and fire and indignation. 
The writer here is saying, you Hebrews know that Christ, he is the Messiah. He is your Savior. He's redeemed you. And you know there's no other way of salvation, but you will live in constant fear of the judgment. You'll live in constant guilt that you're not doing what the Savior saved you to do. A constant, fearful look in this judgment. Child of God, don't live like that. Don't live missing out on the blessings of the fellowship. Don't live missing out on the fellowship and, and, and the encouragement of brothers and sisters praying for you. Let's be found like Amen. Let's lift one another up. Let's provoke unto love and the good works. You know, I, I'll close with this illustration. I was studying this and I thought, you know, if anyone needed an example of just what it means to have have encouragement and to come together. Come with us to work with us that afternoon. Talk to some of those people down there. For almost a year now, they've had a church, a church meeting that has been there on a weekly basis and we come together in fellowship. Less than 10 of them from work work. So Pastor, that's not a big group. No, it's not. And there's a handful of us that are able to go down and, and be there with them. And there's a, a group, 10 or 15, that come from Mount Zion and Auckland to come up. So, Pastor, it's a lot of effort. It is. Pastor, that's a small group there in workforce. Is it worth it? Ask them. Ask them. Because up until almost a year ago, they didn't have anybody that would come and fellowship with them. Yeah, they might have come teaching the Lord God. They were dependent on what they could find all the morning. They were dependent on, you know, just find whatever they could. Going to a church that didn't preach the Word of God, that made fun of them for believing the Word of God. Some of them testified of that. That taught false doctrine. That's all they had. But praise the Lord God, they had a church. They have a place to come together and act your fellowship around the Word of God with like minded believers. Amen. It's worth it. Don't forsake the assembly of yourself. Amen. You need your church. And the church needs you. Just before I pray, our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. That's what I ask. Again, like I said at the beginning, I'm not trying to put any guilt upon anybody this morning. But I just 